Hi everyone, in this video we'll be talking about the subtle art of follow-upping, why is it important, how it should be done and when it should be done. So we can start with why the follow-ups are so important. First of all, you always need to remember that companies are very busy. They don't always see the messages you have sent them or the emails you have sent them. I have talked to a number of CEOs or people in startups saying, yeah, if you don't send me an email at least three times, there is no chance of me seeing that email and so on. So really, from your point of view, maybe it sounds like you're annoying or like you're spamming them, but actually they won't even see your messages if you don't follow up, which is why the first reason why this is so important. Second is that your first message might have just been at a bad timing. They might have seen it and then something happens and they totally forget about it, even though it sounds like a good opportunity for them and something they might want to um, research more about. Maybe it was just at a bad timing and they need a little reminder to check this again and try and have a meeting with us and see if that's something that would interest them. And third, but not least, is that responding might be somewhere on their to-do list. But as I said, companies are very busy, so they will need quite a lot of time for it to become a priority. So yes, it's important for sure to, oops, okay, let's move this here. To remember that just because they didn't answer immediately does not mean that they're not interested. It means they're not interested when they say they are not. Which brings us next to our next um, slide. And why is it important for us? Because we really need an answer. If the answer is yes, of course, that's the best situation that can happen. Then we'll get to work with them or at least have a meeting and try and explain what we do, who we are, why we do it, and so on. If the answer is no, that's still okay. Maybe it's the wrong time for them. Maybe it's um, just not something that interests them overall. But them saying no still gives us a perspective on where we stand at the market, how attractive we are, if we're doing something wrong or right or so on. So getting a no is not the best situation, but it's still a good outcome because at the end, we can still make perspectives and conclusions out of that. So the only bad outcome you can possibly get is to not reach them at all, to not get any kind of an answer which for sure happens sometimes. It doesn't mean it's your fault. There are a lot of people that would like to ignore messages rather than respond, I'm not interested. But by follow-uping a couple of times, we're making sure that that number is as low as possible and that someone expresses their opinion. Either they're interested or they're not. So... Since I already said that their to-do lists are quite long and it might be something on their to-do list, but in a couple of weeks time and so on, this is how to be a priority for their to-do list. And my advice is to always set deadlines um, because if they know that our service is available for them at all times, there is literally no need for them to respond quickly because they know that I have to do this and this and this right now, but I can always get back to that ISAC organization later on. However, if we set a deadline and remind them about that deadline with our follow-up, then they will put it as a priority. If the deadline is in two weeks, then they know, well, until those two weeks, I need to make a research. I need to have a meeting with them and see if it's something I'm interested in. And yeah, they will just prioritize that meeting or that answer to you if they're interested, of course, a lot more. And follow-uping is not spamming them. It's just giving them a reminder of, hey, this deadline is coming up. And if you don't do this right now, then you might miss the opportunity to work with us right now. So this is why my advice is to always set deadlines. 
Next is how I will move here is how and when to follow up. Of course, one of the things that you should always do is keep your messages quite short, quirky, ended with a question, because when you end it with a question, a person is quite more likely to respond to you rather than if you say, if you have any questions, contact us or something like this. So just always end your email or your message with a little question. And remember to diversify channels. Here, I've given just some examples on how you can do that. It does not mean that it has to be this exact structure. In a lot of cases, you cannot find their phone, LinkedIn, and email at the same time. But if you can, of course, that's the best case for us. And why I've put it like this is because when you call them, especially if they don't pick up, which means that you need to follow up afterwards. They don't actually know who the call is from. So from your side, it's like, oh yeah, I've already called this company twice. Why would I send them an email? But from their perspective, they just have a missed call from a stranger's number. And then they get a message that is totally unrelated on LinkedIn or email. And again, some companies don't like calls. They would prefer messages and emails. I've heard both sides. Some CEOs say we don't pick up the phone at all. We only pick up the people who we have saved in contact. So we want to communicate with them on the phone. And I've heard the opposite. If you send me an email, I will never respond to you. But if you call me, then I will most likely pick up and hear you out. So... I want to point out here that diversifying does not mean um, only call, like calling another, using, sorry, using another channel. It can be a call, it can be LinkedIn, it can be email, of course, but if you only have LinkedIn, for example, and you cannot find an email, you cannot find a phone, you can always try and reach out to another person. For example, I've put here, if you initially contacted the CEO, then try the HR and vice versa. Because again, different people have different priorities and some might take the time and say, hey, contact this person instead, but most of them won't. So you're for sure making the chance of someone answering to you a lot bigger if you try to contact another person afterwards if the first one did not answer. Here, as one last thing, of course, I want to point out that follow up does not mean that it specifically has to be a different channel. Of course, you can follow up with a second email or with a third email, even if email is the only thing you have. Um, this is more in case you have different channels where you think, okay, maybe this person is not really communicating through email maybe i'll try another channel but in the cases where you only have one of those of course then you still follow up on for example email if that was your initial approach and it still makes sense because of the reasons i already listed it's gonna get lost in their mailbox it's gonna be somewhere in their emails that they're gonna get back to in two weeks time and so on so that way you're just making us more of a priority Okay, now let's talk about the timeline or the ideal timeline in a sense um, when follow upping. Of course, in the best case scenario, you'll get your answer after the first approach. But that happens quite rarely, I would say, which doesn't mean that you've lost them and they're not interested. It means that you need to follow up. So after the first approach, let's say in this scenario, it can be a call. No one picked up. Okay, then in 24 hours, so the next day, you can try again, either by calling them again, sending an email or LinkedIn, whatever you have available or whatever you prefer. And then if you still don't get anything, try again into working days after the first follow-up. The third and final follow-up should be exactly a week after the first approach. So of course, for all of these, we are still keeping the working times from nine to five. Don't call anyone on a Saturday. 
don't call anyone at 10 in the evening because it's unprofessional, of course, and um, the possibility of them even answering is quite low. So keep to the working days, keep the timeline. And by this timeline, you will either mark them as not interested, not reached, or willing to have a meeting as soon as possible. Whereas if you follow up just once every week for a couple of weeks, then that means that in a month time, you're still trying to approach the same company and it's more work for you and less likely for them to see it, so. Okay, I'm moving to this corner again and then. What is very, very, very important is for you to document every step of the way. Of course, we have our ICX trackers and in those trackers, it's very important for you to put every single thing that happens. I called them, they didn't pick up. I emailed them, they did not respond. I emailed another person, they did not respond or they did respond. And especially if you get an email saying something, so yes, I'll be interested, I want a meeting. No, I won't be interested. We don't search for new people to hire or just approach me next semester. Right now, it's not the good timing for us. Make sure to put that in the trackers because you, you're gonna leave this to the next generation or whoever is coming in the next semester. It might be you, it might not, but when everything is documented, then at least you know what you have to do for next semester or if this company really does not want to be approached by us again, to not be approached by us again, or of course, to just get a meeting, which is the best case. So how to mark things. If they don't respond after the third follow-up, then reapproach them next semester. So you can put in the tracker that you could not reach them, that they were not available, but they should be reapproached for the next semester. If they don't want to work with us and they specifically tell you, no, I'm not in interested in that, then of course, Mark is not interested so that we don't annoy them. If they don't want to work with us and they don't see our service as helpful, then we are not very likely to make them a partner in the next semester as well. If they want to be reapproached at a later date, then leave notes and keep in mind so that the person next semester or you next semester can email them again and say, hey, we contacted you last semester. How about we have a meeting now? And of course, last but not least, always be nice and friendly. We don't want to come off as spammers. Keep your messages short and sweet and just straight to the point. Here I put some examples of a follow-up message. Um, of course, it's just quite short, quite sweet. The point of the whole thing is just to get a meeting with them so we can explain what we do. Because from an email, even if you include the proposal, for example, they will have a lot of questions and if they don't have a meeting with us so that someone can explain stuff they will probably make the wrong conclusions um i've heard a lot of questions for example about pricing about timing about how long stuff takes and so on from where do we take those candidates and so on and if you don't have a meeting they don't have that information, but they are making the wrong conclusions and they are just seeing a price that they have to pay and don't get the value of the service that we are suggesting. So for sure, your idea is to get a meeting with them. So here are quite short two messages. Um, Hi, we think we'll be a great match for a partnership. We sent you an email with more information. Shall we grab a virtual coffee? So in this scenario, this is a follow-up after an email. This is why you say we sent you an email with more information. And still the point is to get a meeting with them. Second example, hi, we are Isaac and we think our project Empower Austria will be a perfect fit for you. When should we set up a meeting so we can tell you more? Again, the whole purpose is to just get the meeting with them and then be able to answer any questions or cover any doubts and convince them that we have a great service that is quite affordable. So use these examples as training wheels, like training wheels on a bike. 
as you as soon as you know how to ride the bike it's not cool to use them anymore as soon as you are a bit more confident um, and you're not a newbie in sales and approaching then you should definitely take the time to make your own templates to make a message that is true to who you are and still is catchy short friendly and would make someone want to go on a meeting with us the idea is not to have this script where it feels as if a robot has sent it but rather to make it a bit more personal add a little hey i saw that you won this award and so on when approaching or follow-uping so that they see that we've made the research into who they are so yes be creative short and sweet and remember why you're doing this so in conclusion, be nice and polite and your messages with a question. Stick to the timeline, stick to the timeline of follow-ups because if you don't follow up, we are losing partners. And even if you remember in two months that you have not done the third follow-up, it's probably too late. It's probably not gonna be a priority either from your or their side. So stick to the timeline, keep it short and sweet. Make up your own templates once you're a bit more confident in approaching and follow-uping. Record every single step in the trackers and remember why we are doing this. Remember why Empower Austria is a great project and what our motivation is for this to happen. So, yes, I think that's all for today about follow-ups. Of course, if you have any questions or you need any help, Approach your VP, approach your TL, approach me even. I will be always up here for questions. Bye.